Open your Bibles with me to Ephesians chapter 5. Going to be in verses 18 through 21 this morning. I forgot to say, good morning. Good morning. All right. There it is. <clears throat> Ephesians 5, 18 through 21. Continuing on from last week, he says, And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for today. I thank you for your word. It is a lamp for our feet, a light for our path. It is sweet like honey that drips from a honeycomb. Lord, your word is is what we desire. And I pray today, Lord, that you would help me to proclaim it clearly and and faithfully, reliably. Father, I pray that you would uh, give us ears to hear that, that your word might fall on good soil, Lord, and bring forth fruit in each and every one of our lives as we look to you our author and perfecter. It's in the name of Jesus I ask these things. Amen. So this morning, um, talking about the Spirit-filled life. The Spirit-filled life is the primary command here is to be filled with the Spirit. And and I want uh, to kind of go through some things to, to bring us up to speed concerning the Spirit. Uh, not that Adam didn't do a fantastic job in Sunday school. I didn't see that one coming. Uh, we dove deep concerning the Spirit. Um, but this morning, I, I want to start with John 14, uh, 15 and through 17. This is the promise of the Holy Spirit, right? This is the beginning of the upper room, uh, the disciples. It's the Last Supper. And, and in the beginning of this, in John 14, Jesus says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. Right. So Jesus gave to his disciples the promise of the Holy Spirit. And just before Jesus's ascension in uh, Acts chapter one, verse five, Jesus said for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Not many days from now, right? And that, and that is what happened, right? Many would say um, that there is a, a, today, that there is some kind of a second baptism, that you're saved and then you need to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. That's false. That's false. Um, the Spirit came in Acts chapter 2, right? The promised Spirit, the Spirit of God that Jesus promised He would send came in Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 1. Um, if you want to hear this sermon, it's, it's in our archives on YouTube in detail. But when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting and divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. The Holy Spirit in that moment came. The baptism of the Holy Spirit came. We know that there is only one baptism. Jesus said it in, the, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 5, For there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and the, so the Spirit came baptized those believers that day. The sign of that, that they knew that they were baptized, were these tongues of fire that rested upon them, a visual identifier that these are the Spirit-filled, these are believers, these are the people of God, these are the one to whom the promise Jesus gave was to, right? And, 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 and again, right, the, that baptism is a one, one, one time event that we come into. The Spirit is the one that makes us alive by that one baptism. The Spirit has come once and for all, right? John 16, uh, in verses 7 through 11, we learn the work of the Holy Spirit. 
right? Jesus said, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Right? There was a point in all of our lives, if we be in Christ, where the Holy Spirit came and revealed our sin to us. Where we saw our need for a Savior. Right? So the Holy Spirit has come into the world to convict concerning sin so that we would see our need for the Savior. It says concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer. Right? The disciples as they walked, they had Jesus with them. Right? To correct them, to instruct them, to train them in righteousness. And and Jesus has left the scene. He is alive and well, but we can't see Him. He is not here with us. Rather, He has sent the Holy Spirit to convict us concerning righteousness, to lead us in the way of righteousness. That is the work of the Holy Spirit in the human heart. And lastly, he says concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged, right? The spirit is at work in this world, in this earth, as a constant reminder to Satan that his days are numbered. Right. And if you are in Christ, it is because of the work of the Holy Spirit who has renewed you in the inner being. Said all that to say this. If you are in Christ, you have the Holy Spirit because it is the Holy Spirit who has made you alive, right? Who has brought you into salvation, who has revealed Christ to you by the, by the uh, will of God. So in verse 18, we see today the responsibility of the believer, right? We are called to live spirit-filled lives. And if we are spirit-filled believers, then we have a responsibility before us. We have a command before us. And we see that in verse 18. And in verses 19 through 21, we see the results of the spirit's work in the believer. Right? Uh, Many would say that the evidence of being filled with the spirit is speaking in tongues. That is false. The evidence of the work of the Holy Spirit in the human life is before us today. That is joy, thanksgiving, and submissiveness to the Holy Spirit, right? This text is concerning the Spirit-filled life and sets the foundation for the rest of this book. So the rest of the way through this book is concerning spiritual life. Our obedience to the Spirit will determine the relationship of husbands and wives in verses 22 through 33, right? Uh, uh, The work of the Spirit in us and how we submit to the Holy Spirit within us uh, is concerning our relationship as parents to children and children to parents in chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. And the relationship between uh, employee, employer, master, and slave in chapter 6, verses 5 through 9, followed by the last section of the book dealing with with spiritual warfare itself and how as believers we fight. So I'm looking forward to it. All right. So first, let's let's look to um, verse 18 here. The responsibility. He says, And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. So the context for drunkenness here in this time period, right? Paul here is dealing directly with cultish behaviors of that day. Um, Drunkenness was a problem in the ancient world. In most Greco-Roman religion, drunkenness was actually a part of the worship experience. uh, The the cult of uh, Dionysus, which was prominent in Ephesus, used wine as its cultic symbol. Right? And, and what they would do is, is to try to drink as much as possible, to, to be out of their mind as possible, to lose all their inhibitions as though in that way they can communicate to the gods or, or be in this spirit world. Have this experience with the gods. And this is what Paul's addressing, right? And what do people say about those who are drunk? They are under the influence, right? They are under the influence. And that is what Paul is addressing here. That which we are influenced by. That which we are influenced by. You could 
bring legal or illegal drugs can come into play here, right? Because the, the emphasis here is not on wine, but drunkenness. That which controls or influences us. And this could be many things. And the, here it's wine, right? Which, which is interesting because wine and throughout the scriptures is used positively also, right? A celebratory drink as uh, the wedding of Cana, right? They run out. And so what does Jesus do? He turns water into wine. Some people say that that wasn't really wine, right? That's the whole miracle. The fact that it was fermented immediately, right? Uh, Paul tells Timothy to take some wine for your belly, right? Wine is not the problem. The problem is the human heart, right? The problem is the human heart, drunkenness, this desire to escape reality, to, to be depressed, right? Certain drugs are beneficial also for certain ailments. In the same way, drugs are not the problem the human heart is. I appreciated hydrocodone when I broke my leg in five places, right? Um, but I can see easily how people would have a hard time getting away from that substance. Right? Many desire to escape fear, pain, life circumstances, and turn to the influence of a depressant to do so, right? And Paul says here, that's debauchery. That's debauchery. I love the Greek word for this is a sodia. It means reckless, wildness, dissipation, debauchery. And it comes from two Greek words, a and sotia. A is similar to the English word. If I were to say if something was asymmetrical, it means it's not symmetrical. Or asynchronous means it's not synchronous. Sodia comes from the root Greek word sozo, which means saved or deliverance. In other words, it could be worded like this. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is not salvation. That is not deliverance. Right? Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones was a physician before he was a pastor, and he helps us to, to, contrast the, to contrast the influence of substance versus the spirit. He says wine or alcohol, pharmacologically speaking, is not a stimulant. It is a depressant. Take up any book on pharmacology and look up alcohol and you will find always that it is classified among the depressants. It is not a stimulant. Further, it depresses first and foremost the highest centers of all the brain. They control everything that gives a man self-control, wisdom, understanding, discrimination, judgment, balance, the power to assess everything. In other words, everything that makes a man behave at his very best and highest. What the Holy Spirit does, however, is the exact opposite. If it were possible to put the Holy Spirit into a textbook of pharmacology, it would put him under the stimulants, for that is where he belongs. He really does stimulate. He stimulates our every faculty, the mind and the intellect, the heart and the will. Right? The negative. Don't be out of control. Don't, don't be drunk. Don't be influenced by. Don't be controlled by. But the positive, but rather be filled with the Holy Spirit, be filled with the Spirit. That's our influence, right? Uh, most Greek scholars would say this would probably be better worded. Be being kept filled. Right. It's 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 a it's a verb. It's present. It's continuous. It's an action. It's a command. We are to be being kept filled. It's. Present, which means it's continuous. We always must be being kept filled, right? If being filled with alcohol places under its influence and control, and that is not the way of salvation, then being filled with the Spirit means to be under His influence and control, which is the way of salvation. Those under the uh, influence of substance lose control, those under the influence of the Holy Spirit gain control, right? And self-control is the final fruit of the Spirit, according to Galatians 5, 23. The means of becoming drunk is wine. 
right? The means of becoming filled is the Spirit, and the content of the filling is the fullness of the triune God. Now, we saw back in chapter 3, verse 19, as Paul was praying, he says, to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. In chapter 4, verse 13, he said, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's where the Spirit is taking us in its continuous work in our hearts, in our minds, in our lives as we yield and submit to the Holy Spirit. That's who we're to be controlled by. Our responsibility in the matter is to yield to the Holy Spirit that is at work within us and walk in His ways. I, 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 speaking of obedience to the Holy Spirit, um, I love how Thomas Watson put this, the Puritan in A Body of Divinity, concerning the Spirit. He says, Obey God, the Holy Ghost, Our souls are breathed into us by the glorious Spirit. The Spirit of God hath made me, said Job. Our souls are adorned by the blessed Spirit. Every grace is a divine spark lighted in the soul by the Holy Ghost. Nay, more, the Spirit of God sanctified Christ's human nature. He united it with the divine and fitted the man Christ to be our mediator. Well then, does this third person in the Trinity, the Holy Ghost, deserve to be obeyed? For he is God, and this tribute of homage and obedience is due to him from us. Right? This is a call for us as believers not to be controlled by anything outside of ourselves, but to be controlled by the Holy Spirit of God within us. To be controlled by him, to look to him to lean upon Him in all circumstances, to, to, lean, to, to be yielded to Him. All right, brothers and sisters, if you are in Christ, it is because of the Holy Spirit who is your comforter, who assists you in prayer, who intercedes for you in accordance to God's will. He leads you into righteousness and produces His fruit in you. The biblical norm for all believers is that we walk in the Spirit. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. The Spirit has given us life in the new birth, and we must continue to live day by day in the Spirit. That is the responsibility of the believer. To walk in the Spirit means that we yield to His control We follow His lead, and we allow Him to influence us. Walking in the Spirit is opposite of resisting the Spirit, as Paul warned about in the previous chapter. I I couldn't think of a good example of it. I I was was thinking about anybody in their right mind that was going out to to, to mow the lawn would just say, forget the lawnmower, I think I'll use scissors. (laughs) Right? But that's, that's similar to what we do when we would go our own way and resist the Holy Spirit. Right? We're doing what doesn't make sense. And going back to the last sermon, we're wasting time. We must yield to the Holy Spirit's power. We are to be being kept filled by the Spirit in the pursuit of Christ's likeness. And what is the result of that? As I said, There are many things that people would say is the evidence of the Holy Spirit in our lives, but what the Word of God says here is that the result, looking at verses 19 through 21, is joyfulness, thankfulness, and submissiveness, submission. First, we see joyfulness. Look at verse 19. The command, primary command, was in verse 18. These are participles attached to that command. It says, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. Right? We, we see two participles here. First, addressing one another, and second, singing and making melody to the Lord. Right? One is horizontal. One is vertical. Right? Horizontally, it says, addressing one another... In psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, and that's not talking about our fellowship. I don't approach James. Hello, Pastor James. How are you doing today? And that's not what it's talking about. The context is public worship. The context here is public worship. 
For example, Psalm 95, I think this is what Paul's getting at here. Psalm 95, starting in verse 1, I'll just read verse 1. It gives you the idea. It says, O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. The psalm is not in that moment being sung to the Lord God. It's being sung to one another, to encourage one another, to, to lift your voices to the Lord God. We just sing another example of that. We just addressed one another in song when we said, come praise and glorify well, we weren't calling upon God to come and praise and glorify himself, but rather one another. We're addressing one another in psalm and hymn and spiritual song. That's the context there. That's what we are doing. The word psalm, these are three words embracing the whole thing, right? Singing, making melody in our hearts. It's, it's addressing all of it. The word psalm means to strike. Uh, similar to the striking of a guitar string, the striking of a drum, all those instruments we see in Psalm 150, right? Psalm means to strike, and we, we, we have a book dedicated to the Psalms, right? Uh, songs, odes, in other words, that, that were music was put to many times we see to the chief musician, from the chief musician, of the chief musician, right? So a psalm has to do with instrumentation, a uh, hymn means song of praise. A as we ascribe the glory that is due the name of our great God, we are singing hymns and spiritual songs. Some I, commentators I said has to say that that has to do with the mood of the song. I don't know. I think it just means songs that are doctrinally sound. We sing sometimes Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We're not addressing one another. We're not necessarily ascribing glory due to God, but we're indoctrinating one another with the truth of the word. It's a spiritual song. Or the first thing that popped into my mind is when my wife sings to the kids, Zacchaeus was a wee little man, was a wee little man, was he? Climbed up in a sycamore tree for Jesus he wanted to see. It's indoctrinating. It's a spiritual song. So we see the whole encompass here of psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. It's not a debate like it was 20 years ago. Do you sing hymns or do you sing this? Right? It's all encompassing. We address one another in spiritual hymns and songs. It's horizontal and it's vertical. Look here. Singing and making melody to the Lord with your hearts. Singing and making melody. Singing again is just re repetition. We're singing. We know what that is, right? Making melody. That's has to do with instrumentation and the, being that it's from the heart. We, I, I think of this as my grandpa. My grandpa, everywhere this man went, he was whistling a hymn. I don't know how his whistle stayed wet. He was always whistling, but what that expresses is the joy of the Lord in the heart, from the heart, right? As we would hum. I like to hear my kids hum, right? As we whistle, as we would make melody in our heart to the Lord, expressing the joy that we have in Christ. It's vertical as we express it to the Lord. There's a parallel passage. Colossians uh, 3 verse 16 says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and warning one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. I love singing and playing instruments and I could as I told James really geek out right here but I'm going to spare you um, and look at the bigger picture here there are two present participles in this verse addressing is one singing and making melody is the other and they are actions that are a result of being filled with the spirit an action that is to be continuous and what these express is joyfulness The result of the Holy Spirit, the evidence of the Holy Spirit in the human life is joyfulness here. Right? Satan is a counterfeit. That, that's why there are clubs where you can get drunk and play and sing and dance the songs of the world. Right? And have a false sense of joy. Those without Christ don't have joy. They don't have joy. The world confuses joy with happiness. And consequently, I think many Christians do as well. 
I think oftentimes we confuse joy with happiness. Happiness is temporal and it's dependent on what happens, upon happenstance. Right? Joy is a fruit given by the Spirit according to Galatians 5.22. Listen to what Warren Wiersbe says concerning joy. I love this. Christian joy is not a shallow emotion that is like a thermometer. Rises and falls and changes atmosphere with the home, right? Uh, The thermometer changes when its atmosphere changes. Rather, Christian joy is a deep experience of adequacy and confidence in spite of the circumstances around us. The Christian can be joyful even in the midst of pain and suffering. This kind of joy is not a thermometer, but a thermostat. Instead of rising and falling with the circumstances, it determines the spiritual temperature of those circumstances. That's joy. I thought immediately of a, of, of a scripture brought out last Wednesday night, Philippians 4:11 through 13, when Paul says, "Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, I know how to abound. In, in, in any and every circumstances, I have learned the secret to facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me." Paul in this context of contentment is revealing his joy that is like a thermostat. All right, he's not controlled by circumstances, but rather displays self-control in every circumstance. And that's what being filled with the Spirit does. We have self-control as a fruit of the Holy Spirit in all circumstance, and nothing can take our joy because it too is a gift from God. The joy of the Lord is our very strength. That's the Spirit's work. And isn't it wonderful to live and work with people who are filled with the Spirit and joyful versus those who are grumpy and angry and do not sing the song of the Lord? Right? But those who have a song in their heart and on their lips... It's only by the power of the Spirit's work within us that we can sing joyfully to the Lord, that we can uh, do so even in our pain and suffering, right? You guys do it every week. We all go through pain and suffering, and we had a wonderful sermon concerning suffering last week. Why is it that you can come in here and sing for joy to the Lord? Because of the power of the Holy Spirit at work within you and the hope that you have for eternity. Because you trust the promises of God, just as Paul and Silas did in their despair, in their suffering, sitting in a Philippian prison. And what was the result of their singing praises and praying to the Lord? The result was the salvation of a jailer and his entire family. Right? Joy. If you are filled with the Holy Spirit, then you enjoy being together and experience oneness in the Lord. The Spirit of God is all that we need, right? In the contrast, we don't need drunkenness. We need to be filled with the Spirit because the joy of the Lord is our strength. Second, thankfulness. Joyfulness and thankfulness. Look at verse 20. Giving thanks always and for, uh, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, I think the biggest uh, hindrance to thankfulness, probably to us in everyday life, is taking things for granted. We take so much for granted. From the the food on our table, I hope we all give thanks. Right? We take granted for so many things. It's, It's, you know, many boys or girls become annoyed by parents who keep writing their case about this or that. Right? This, this annoyance is a lack of thanksgiving for parents who desire to instruct you in righteousness. Right? One of the big causes of marriage issues is taking each other for granted. And, and we're all guilty of this. Uh, you know, to become frustrated with a spouse over something so little, dumb, and trivial, rather than being thankful 
for the spouse that God gave you. Right? This is how we exalt Christ in our home by being thankful for all that the Lord has given to us. It is the Holy Spirit that produces in us thankfulness that is a grace from God. Now, I think the best place to look to is, is in this moment is, is a, Romans chapter 8. James mentioned a while back that we should all read Romans 8 often, right? And, and I believe, I believe that's, that's very true. Romans 8, 28 through 29 says, And we know for those who love God, all things work together for good. All things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that we might be the firstborn among many brethren. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. That encompasses what we see as good and bad. God calls all things good. We don't, right? This, this encompasses the wedding and the funeral. Life and death. Sickness, health. These things are good because they are doing what they're supposed to do. They're conforming us to the image of God, right? We're to give thanks always in everything. That, that is not to say that we are to thank God for evil. Right? Satan is the God of this world. There is evil all around us. Evil things happen to us. We don't give thanks for the evil, but we do give thanks for the God who is gracious to us in it. It is Satan who is a liar and a murderer and a thief. And he does his work. But we can be thankful to God in those moments because of the promise and the hope that we have and the grace that he gives and the assurance that he gives because no matter what, he is working all things for good. We see it in the life of Joseph who his brothers sold him into slavery, right? They threw him in a pit, sold him to slave traders. He goes to Egypt Winds up in Potiphar's house. The wife lies about him, gets thrown in prison again. Stays there for a really long time, interprets a couple dreams, tells the cupbearer to remember him. The cupbearer didn't. He's still in prison. And at some time, eventually, Pharaoh would have a dream. The cupbearer would remember Joseph. Joseph would interpret that dream that there would be seven good years and seven years of famine. He's lifted to the highest in command under the Pharaoh and set over all his affairs. So they store up grain for seven years. And in seven years, when the famine comes, where must his brothers go to get grain? To Joseph. And he sees them face to face. And in Genesis 50, verse 20, listen to the words of Joseph speaking to his brothers. As for you, you meant evil against me. But God meant it for good. To bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Sometimes it's hard to be thankful, but we don't know what tomorrow holds. And God does work all things for His good, for your good, and His glory. Amen? Those who are of the world want the depressant, right? They want to become influenced by the lack of care that both drugs or alcohol might bring. They want to be numbed, right? But those who belong to the kingdom of God and those who belong to the world, they do have one thing in common, and that's suffering. One turns to a depressant, but our response is different because we have hope. In everything, we are thankful to God who is working all things for our good and His glory. In fact, the word gratitude in the Greek comes from the same root as grace, right? 
And if we have experienced the grace of God, then we ought to be grateful for what God brings to us. The result of the Holy Spirit is thanksgiving. And third, the result of the Holy Spirit is submissiveness. Verse 21, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. This verse sets the stage for verses, uh, for verses 22 through chapter 6, verse 9. Right, Moving forward, God gives structure to submission in the home and workplace. But here, the, the, the participle is to the whole church. The context is, is being out of control versus in self-control. It's funny, Jesus often tried to teach his disciples um, not to boast, right? As they would walk along the way, or uh, he would um, often try to, to teach them not to make themselves look good at someone else's expense. However, they failed to learn the lesson. And even at the Last Supper, they were arguing over who was the greatest among them. Sitting at the table with Jesus, they're arguing who's the greatest among us. Right? We see it in Luke 22, starting in 24. A dispute also arose among them as to which of them was to be regarded as the greatest. Listen to Jesus' reply. The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those in authority over them are called benefactors. But not so with you. Rather, let the greatest among you become as the youngest, and the leader is the one who serves. In other words, in the Gentile kingdom, in this world, the greater one, the, the, the who, who is in charge over you is the greatest, and you are just the little guys down here subject to the greatest one. Jesus says it's not like that in the kingdom of God. Verse 27 says, For who is greater, the one who reclines at table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at the table? But I am among you as the one who serves. Jesus Christ himself.